For today's bike check, we are having a look at this very special Yeti C26. Uh, it's a 1990 replica of John Tomac's race bike. As with any bike check, the most important thing is the frame. And have you seen anything quite like this? Probably not, is the answer. So this is a Yeti C26. Uh, well, it's actually a replica because apparently originally there were only ever three of these made. One for Julie Furtado, one for John Tomac, and I don't know about the other one, but this is a replica of Tomac's race bike. Now he raced his version of this, which honestly, you barely tell him apart, at the very first UCI Mountain Bike World Championships, uh, which was in 1990 at Durango in Colorado. Now, Tomac competed in both the cross country and the downhill on this bike. Uh, I think he got a puncture in the cross country, but in the downhill, we got fourth place with drop handlebars, which just sounds bonkers to me because they're just not fit for purpose. Uh, some people might wonder why he was using drops, but it's essentially because he was a professional road racer, back to back as a mountain biker, and he wanted to keep the same position between bikes uh, to keep some consistency with his training and the handling. But back to the frame. Now, Yeti have their racing heritage on steel frames, on chromoly frames known as the FRO, the FRO or the four racing only. Now, they'd never messed around or experimented with carbon fiber, but in 1990, they decided to make one of these. Now, it's a very special bike because of the fact there was only the three original ones built. And it's using Eastern E9 carbon tubing here for the top tube, the down tube and the seat tube. Now it's not full carbon, it's unidirectional carbon wrapped over extremely lightweight alloy on there. So not only are these immensely strong, but they're very, very light. They're exactly half the weight of the chromoly equivalent and twice the strength. So you can see the lure of wanting to use this technology in a mountain bike. Now the lugs essentially are from a Yeti FRO frame. Now the cool thing about this replica bike is it's built from the same exact batch of carbon tubing as those original three. Uh, now, I don't know the full story of how this came to be, how they managed to get this tubing set, but it was still laying around from the early days. Now, the bike was called the C26 after the guy that used to assemble these. Now, his name is Chris Herting, and he's actually got a signature down here because he assembled this very bike using the exact same technique with the original tubing. So, as far as replicas go, it's really the same as John Tomac's bike. It's, uh, it's not just a look-alike, it really is exactly the same. Now, I think it's absolutely a work of art and it's really cool to see the way that the lugs just really nicely accept that carbon tubing. It's very, very flush up close. But rumor has it, with those original race bikes, the original John Parker behind Yeti was a bit scared uh, after Julie and Tomek were racing that the, the bonding agent would come loose. So he took the bikes back off them to inspect them. But it's a pretty cool story and I don't think any actually failed. Now, something that Yetis are known for is their color, which is like a Yeti blue, Yeti turquoise. Uh, you hear people call it different things, but the actual color comes from a pickup truck that was once spotted, uh, and it's called Desert Turquoise, and it's an iconic colorway for them. So this one clearly features that. It's got the Yeti on the head tube there. And the back end of the bike has some telltale signs that Yeti always used. Note the curve between the chain stay and the seat stay. That's just such a beautiful shape. And that's so, so characteristic of all Yeti arc and fro frames of the sort of early 90s. And there's a really nice wishbone design. Again, losing that lovely curved loop tubing, uh, joining onto a wishbone behind the bottom bracket shell. It's just really nice and tidy. Pretty good chain clearance down here. Uh, nothing where you're gonna get any chain suck, which was something that you used to get with triple chain rings on there. Uh, not bad mud clearance by all accounts, uh, considering it was a bike that came from Colorado. And now up to the cockpit of the bike, uh, probably the most iconic part of it actually, because uh, everyone remembers Tomac absolutely destroying people with drop handlebars, which just to me even seems crazy because bikes in this era weren't exactly easy to ride. Uh, so the stem is an unnamed one on here, but it looks just like a Tioga stem, uh, which is what Tomac used to use. So it may, may be one without the Tioga decal on there you've got a Shimano Dior XT headset. Now this is a classic headset because it's got a threaded one inch steerer tube in here and the headset actually screws onto the steerer tube and you have two nuts. You have a lock nut and a nut to adjust the actual bearing. Uh, so on the inside, it's probably got, I'd imagine quarter inch bearings perhaps on the bottom, uh, maybe 332s. I kind of forget to be honest, they're quite old school, uh, but it's really cool to see an original Dior XT headset on here. Uh, Chinelli drop handlebars up on the front here with Chinelli grip tape and Durace uh, brake levers and shifters. So you've got an STI unit on the, on the right-hand side. This is actuating the rear brake, 
because he's talking about running a brake, it's the US way. Uh, and he's got an eight speed shifter mechanism built into the levers there, like the classic STI. Uh, the left hand lever operating a front brake is just plain and simple, it's just a brake lever. And you've actually got a gear shifter on the end of the bars here for the front mech, which that just looks bizarre. If you think what we have today, can you imagine, you'd probably be knocking your knees and stuff on that. So to think that that was even on the bike just seems crazy to me. Uh, it's actuating a set of Shimano Dior XT cantilever brakes, uh, very old school looking on probably one of the most beautiful forks of all time, the original Manitou One. Uh, designed by Doug Bradbury, it's an elastomer sprung fork, uh, 40 millimeters of travel um, if they're maintained, otherwise you're not gonna get much out of them. Amazingly, these ones still seem to work. Now the thing with elastomer rubber uh, is basically a spring and a damper, it has friction damping associated with it. And all right, they weren't the best thing, but they weren't that bad at the time, provided the weather didn't affect them because you've got different types of elastomer. You've got regular elastomer, which is essentially just rubber, and you get uh, MCU, so microcellular urethane, which was less affected by temperatures. Uh, when I say affected by it, if you ride in cold weather, the forks could firm up and hot weather they could get a bit softer. Uh, I don't actually know what's on the inside of these, but they do surprisingly still manage to work. Uh, lovely stuff to see. And of course, wheel size was 26 inch. There wasn't anything else uh, in 1990 as far as mountain bikes were concerned. It's running specialized BX23 rims, uh, super narrow profile on those with silver spokes and nipples laced up to a Shimano Dior XT hub with a ringlet quick release skewer on there in a classic purple of the era. Uh, it looks great, I love seeing this stuff. Uh, the little rubber grommet on the end has perished slightly, but don't wanna mess with that in case it comes off. Pretty cool, it's original. Tires, uh, John Tammet used to run Tioga tires. And in fact, one of the most iconic tires of all time, the Farmer John, was named after John Tomac, because uh, technically he's a farmer. Um, very cool stuff. These ones have a trail dog on the front and he's got a mud dog on the rear, uh, which kind of makes me laugh. I used to run that tire, I think it was a good mud tire, but when you look at that tire, the lugs are so close together, it's like it just would have clogged up instantly. Front tire, the shoulder, by all accounts, doesn't look too bad on it. Uh, center tread, a little bit vague, but not actually that bad for the era. Uh, it's a 26 by 195. They say 195, but that looks more like a 1.5. It looks absolutely tiny. Must be terrifying to ride. And out to the back of the bike, that is that Tioga Mud Dog tire. Again, like if you actually space the, the nobles apart, it actually looks like a pretty good tread. I almost think that someone could remake that now and it would be a pretty good tire. Uh, again, it's a 26 by 195 with the same rim laced up onto an XT hub. Uh, but laced up very differently, not using spokes, instead using the Tioga tension disc. So this is the Tioga disc drive, and these, what they appear to be strings, they're Kevlar strands, or known as geodesic webbing. So the whole concept behind this was, this whole sort of tension disc would replace the spokes, allowing for some sort of compliance, almost like rear suspension. Uh, one of the cool things about it was, yeah, it looked really obscure and different. It had a crazy sound. If you imagine like a rolling snare drum sort of noise, uh, some people used to call them like a dustbin, uh, just a sort of a rumbling noise. It was iconic, just sounded amazing. Sadly, this one has delaminated with age, so I, you can't sit on the bike, can't ride it, but it's still, it's just a work of art. They were frighteningly expensive in the 90s. I've got a feeling they were like 400 quid or something back then, which just, just seems crazy. And you've got a Shimano Dior XT cassette, uh, an eight-speed cassette on here, and you've got an XT short cage derailleur. Up on the front though, it's got a Shimano Triple XT setup. I'm pretty sure on Tomax bike, he used to use the bullseye cranks. Bullseye cranks, although they were plagued by bearing issues on some of them in the early days, were actually so far ahead in terms of design. They're a bit more similar to what we see now with the modern Shimano XTs. You'd have an axle that's part of the, I think the right hand crank and the left hand crank would preload on and clamp onto the axle. A brilliant system, super stiff, uh, but this bike has XTs on here. Um, if any like super retro uh, fans watching this know, let me know underneath. I'd love to actually just confirm that, but I'm pretty sure we had bullseyes on here's one. There's a Shimano DRXT front derailleur and the classic M737 pedals on there. So that is the first SPD pedal by Shimano that came out in 1990. Uh, and that really was a revolution as far as pedals on mountain bikes went, because no one really rode flat pedals. You had to ride toe clips or power grips, if anyone remember those, they're sort of a power strap to actually literally strap your feet onto the pedals. So when these came out, it changed the way you could ride off-road. Your feet no longer bounce off the pedals. You could spin efficient circles like our roadie friends were doing, uh, but it was just much more fit for purpose on mountain bikes. And I bet they still work absolutely fine now because they were built like tanks. 
And finishing kit on the frame, we can see he's got two bottle cages in the front triangle there. Uh, quite cool to see them stacked up like that rather than having one on the seat tube. Uh, not sure why that is, but it looks cool and you obviously need a couple if you're racing in Colorado. A Shimano XT seat post, which weren't the most common post out there, so it's quite cool to see that. Another ring leg quick release skewer there and a Sorel turbo saddle on there. Uh, it's a lovely piece of kit and as far as replicas go, it's just bonkers that uh, this frame even exists. Uh, now I do wonder how old Chris Hurton was when he actually built this frame because the original would have been C26 and if this one was keeping real, it was, I'm guessing it's probably more like C40 or something like that. Uh, but a very cool bike uh, and absolutely crazy that this was raced off-road uh, to fourth place in a downhill race. Pretty nuts, isn't it? Uh, if you've got any questions or anything about bikes of this era or this particular bike, uh, I'd love to hear from you. Let us know in those comments underneath. Hopefully you've liked uh, looking and learning about something that's pretty rare, pretty special and absolutely bizarre. Uh, I've, I've loved looking at it. We'll see you in the next video. It's all right.